Good morning, I'm here with Jolie and Morm QC, founder and director of the Good Law Project. Um, thank you very much for giving up your time for us today. Great pleasure. So for those who don't know, would you be able to briefly describe what the Good Law Project is and what sort of inspired you to initiate it? So it's a not-for-profit um, that relies on um, members of the public's willingness to fund um, pieces of public interest litigation. Um, it was born out of um, a perception that I had, and I think a lot of other people had as well, uh, that our politics wasn't really operating very well, um, that our politicians had become sometimes rather venal, that the um, organs of state that we rely upon to enforce the law weren't doing that job very well. Uh, and so we needed to be reliant more on um, the third pillar of our constitution, on the rule of law, um, to secure that the law was properly applied and that people's rights were um, adequately protected. And sort of in which ways has this project been used to challenge and how does it continue to challenge the UK's withdrawal from the European Union? So um, the Good Law Project um, brought each of the three um, pieces of Brexit litigation to have succeeded so far. So the case that became Gina Miller's case, um, Good Law Project launched four or five days before um, she sent out her press release. Then um, we brought a successful judicial review of the Electoral Commission's failure um, to investigate both Leave's overspending and its um, misunderstanding of the law governing donations in the course of the referendum. Uh, and then the case that's just been decided and perhaps the most important thing I'll ever do in my life um, is a case that established that the United Kingdom could just cancel Brexit. Um, we could uh, cancel the notice that we sent to the EU uh, announcing we wanted to leave the EU. Uh, and if we did cancel, we'd be able to retain the benefit of all of the um, opt-outs, the rebates, the sort of privilege treatment that we specially enjoy. So it could be, if you wanted to put it provocatively, uh, as though Brexit was just a bad dream from which we could all wake up. So with that in mind, what is the end goal regarding Brexit and regarding your particular influence? Um, well, I mean, in my personal life, I believe that Brexit is not in the national interest. I believe that in 2016, I argued um, forcefully for it during the course of the referendum campaign. Um, I continue to believe that's true. Um, but that's not really the work the Good Law Project does. The Good Law Project's work is about securing um, that uh, the governance of Brexit is good. So ensuring that the rules are observed, that the executive doesn't, you know, a very greedy, a very power hungry executive doesn't usurp the functions of parliament, um, that secures that uh, Parliament can make all of the choices that should be open to Brexit because it's not um, turning out um, like any of us hoped. Um, even its greatest enthusiasts, I think, have become um, rather disheartened by the reality of what Brexit's likely to look like. I think a lot of people would hear that and still sort of dismiss those arguments and accuse you of trying to stop Brexit and trying to go against sort of the referendum of 2016. How would you respond to those people, those who still passionately defend that referendum <coughs> and passionately um, proclaim that we should be leaving the European Union? Well, I, I mean, I understand uh, uh, those criticisms. I say I'm very honest about the fact that I thought and think that the United Kingdom... Um, is doing itself a disservice by leaving the EU. Um, but it's also true to say that I'm a Democrat. I said um, very clearly uh, that had I been in it, uh, an MP when Parliament was voting on whether to trigger the Article 50 notice, I would have voted to trigger it. I then believed um, it was what the referendum mandated. Um, of course, things have changed somewhat. We now know uh, that there was um, cheating, it's fair to call it that, by the Leave side, um, they significantly overspent. Um, and we know that uh, the promises that were made to the people about um, what Brexit would, <coughs> excuse me, 
promises that were made to people about what Brexit would uh, look like are unlikely to be, they won't be delivered. Um, and so I think, you know, in those circumstances, especially when you have an advisory referendum, that um, Parliament has to be free to decide um, how best to act. And fundamentally, that's what um, certainly the most recent case that I've brought um, establishes. It gives Parliament that right. Just to go into more detail on something you said there, what were those promises that the British people heard and that Vote Leave um, provided with them, provided them? Um, and in what way have we seen that those promises can't be fulfilled? So, um, uh, certainly there was a widespread belief that Brexit would make people better off. So in December 2016, YouGov polled leavers on um, how, <coughs> how many thought that Brexit would make them worse off, and only 11% then believed that Brexit would uh, make them worse off. Um, I don't think um, the evidence today um, supports what they then believed to be uh, the truth. Um, we were told things like uh, we would have the easiest trade deal in history, we were promised uh, sunlit uplands, um, we were threatened with an army of uh, invading um, Turkish citizens at the doors to the United Kingdom would be thrown open to, um, to, to, to millions of, of Turks in very unfortunate um, uh, signalling language to um, less attractive parts, I think, of um, the political discourse in the UK. Uh, we were promised that there would be a gradual um, departure from uh, the arrangements that we have with the EU, uh, a promise in stark contrast to what is now um, facing the country, i.e. that we might leave without any deal at all. Um, you know, it was not, a, it was not I think, uh, in any way, a sort of high point in the functioning of a mature democracy. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, if you're a Democrat, you have to look to Parliament to decide how to respond to those things. Um, I understand that, and I'm not in Parliament, uh, but I do think that it's right that Parliament should have um, the right, the freedom to choose how to respond to um, what we now know uh, about what Brexit um, will look like and about how those campaigns are conducted, and that's what um, my work seeks to do. And what, in your view, would be that adequate response from Parliament? Um, I mean, I, um, I mean, I've written in the I wrote in Financial Times last week. Um, I said that I thought um, we really needed to be honest with ourselves. And by the we in that sentence, I mean my political tribe. So people who are empowered, people who are the beneficiaries of globalization, people who have have done very well um, over the last few decades. We need to be honest um, about what that vote means. It's not enough for us to say the people wanted Brexit and so despite knowing that it will be um, very damaging for um, their economic well-being, um, we should give it to them. It is easier, of course, to say that than it is to um, redress the imbalances in society that have um, created the circumstances in which people have voted for something as um, self-destructive as, as, as Brexit. And so I do think, um, certainly if I was in Parliament, uh, I would be making the case for us simply to revoke the Article 50 notice um, without a further referendum. Um, that I think is uh, uh, part of um, a mature, thoughtful, engaged response to that referendum. The remainder of the response has to be um, rebalancing the economy um, away from uh, London uh, and really addressing the things that people in left behind communities do actually care about. I think many would probably question how realistic um, that sort of response from Parliament would be to revoke Article 50 without a further referendum, um, especially because of the social outlaw that would probably arise as a result. Um, so if this were to be sort of pushed aside as an option because of the social consequences, would you support the use of a further referendum? 
I mean, I, 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 I do hear that point. That having been said, uh, John Major, Sadiq Khan, um, and others have already said that Article 50 should be revoked without a, a further referendum. Um, and uh, you need to understand, I think, that there is no good way out of the situation in which we find ourselves. There is no uh, way that leaves uh, no one feeling as though their democratic um, franchise has been ignored. All ways out from here are bad. Uh, the real question is, um, which is the worst? Um, and um, I think if you ignore that point, as much of the political discourse tends to, um, really what you're doing is you're selling, you're mis-selling, as it were, to the population all over again uh, the notion that um, uh, there is some easy, cost-free solution to what ails them. I think that's the sort of reasoning that got us into uh, the problems that we now have, rather than the sort of reasoning that gets us out of it. Um, that having been said, um, uh, what the Prime Minister said this morning, which is that in a sense it would be a betrayal of the people um, to ask the people to vote on whether or not they want Brexit now that they know what it looks like, um, is, I think we need to be blunt, is a nonsense. Um, you cannot betray the people by asking the people. Uh, so um, if Parliament does not support a a revocation of Article 50, uh, then um, absolutely I would be in favour of a, of, a, of a referendum on what the deal actually looks like. What is the reality of Brexit versus the reality of remaining? So going back to vote leave and all those campaigning for leaving the European Union, what would you accuse those people of? We talked about the false promises. Was it incompetence? Was it something more sinister? If you read the very interesting posts of um, Dominic Cummings, who was the sort of campaign director of Vote Leave, um, what you see is that he recognised very early on that there was no majority for any vision of the country's future outside the EU. He uh, said that um, basically uh, the only way in which you might get the Leave vote over the line was to form a coalition, a, a false coalition, that's my editorialising rather than his words, but a false coalition between those who saw the future of the United Kingdom uh, as a closed economy, uh, a sort of nativist vision, you'd shut globalisation out, um, and those on the other hand who saw uh, the United Kingdom's future as a very open economy, uh, that you would welcome in globalisation. Um, and uh, there were supporters for the sort of nativist vision, there were supporters of the open vision, um, and those two visions are fundamentally contradictory, and Dominic Cummings recognises that. Um, neither of them would have got anything like as many votes as Remain did. And so um, I think if you're being really um, grown up, if you're being really honest, um, you do say, um, and I believe with justification, that there is not really a, a mandate. You know, if you're mature, if you're thoughtful, if you're engaged, um, if you're honest, um, there isn't really a mandate for leave. Um, I understand what the numbers say, um, but I just don't think they tell a sufficient part of the story. With this in mind, um, accepting that we're in some sort of mess, where did it all go wrong? Who, who can we point to, what can we point to, to explain how we got to the, to the stage we are in now? Uh, I mean, the roots of Brexit lie in our response to the financial crisis, I think. They lie in the fact that um, uh, a particular class um, benefited from the boom that preceded the financial crisis. That same class um, delivered the financial crisis, um, but that class has not seen really any of the costs of the financial crisis. Those costs have been put on uh, a class of people who didn't benefit from the boom and didn't um, uh, generate the crisis itself. Um, and I think the way in which um, uh, the establishment in the UK 
um, has dealt with the crisis and the sequelae um, has sown um, the roots of the public discontent that we now see and are likely to continue to see because there's not really any interest, um, not any serious interest in addressing um, uh, those problems. Um, I mean, more immediately, uh, that um, background uh, enabled populists on the left and on the right to offer um, the allure of easy solutions to, to complex problems. Um, populism always rises up from uh, uh, profound uh, economic um, uncertainty. Um, and uh, that delivered the vote. Uh, we've also um, mishandled the aftermath of the referendum too, because the sort of governing um, feature of uh, the Prime Minister's conduct of Brexit since the referendum, in my mind at least, has been her disinclination to be honest with the British people about what Brexit actually means. She has not grappled with that, co with that tension inherent in um, the Brexit vote, the tension between those who want a closed economy and the tension between uh, those who want the open economy. So we're still really at the stage of asking ourselves the question, uh, two and a half years on, um, what does Brexit mean? What's it for? What's it about? And so we have um, these really rather disingenuous attempts on the part of different constituencies in the Conservative Party and indeed some constituencies in the Labour Party um, to claim ownership um, of that Brexit vote, to assert um, uh, that they alone understand what it was that the people will. But the truth is that the people willed a number of contradictory things and there is um, no uh, majority for, for any of them. Um, we haven't address those tensions. We still so show no signs of wanting to. Uh, and that, that is storing up really profound problems for the future. What can we expect from the next couple of months? Obviously, we're in some sort of stalemate at the moment. What do you think will happen? Um, I think we're going to have a second referendum. Um, I uh, don't know whether Parliament would support such a thing if asked that question today. But um, what we do see in the polling is an increasing divergence between the Leave and Remain support lines that have been basically running in parallel since the referendum. Leave support is starting to fall away. Remain support is starting to rise. And there's this odd paradox, isn't there? Um, that politicians will only vote for a second referendum if they see that um, support for leave has fallen away significantly. If support for leave has fallen away significantly, then you might ask yourself the question, well, why do we actually need a, a referendum to, to, to prove that? Um, I mean, if you look at the alternatives, um, I mean, many of us would have... Um, wanted uh, a sort of EEA plus a membership of the Single Market and Customs Union. We would have welcomed that as a, as a, a compromise. Um, but I don't see the Labour Party supporting that outcome. Um, uh, no deal, well, I mean, what the ERG have generously shown us um, is that there really is um, but a tiny proportion of Parliament um, that can contemplate uh, us leaving the EU without a deal. Uh, and that doesn't really leave much. It leaves Theresa May's deal, which is um, uh, widely unloved. Prime Minister's strategy of trapping MPs between the cliff edge of no deal on the one hand um, and her deal on the other um, is uh, uh, fatally hold below the waterline by the option that the Good Law Project's litigation in Luxembourg opened up of us simply cancelling Brexit. Um, I think if you weigh all of those things together, uh, none of them is without difficulty, none of them is, is, is without 
uh, risk. You can't really be certain. But I have moved from believing that we will find ourselves in an endless transition period. My base case now is that we will have a further referendum. And what would be the worst case scenario, in your opinion? I mean, the, the Democrat in me um, rather thinks that the worst case scenario would be Theresa May's deal. Um, I think that will leave um, everyone feeling profoundly unhappy. Uh, nobody will get what they want. Um, it does store up for the future. Um, all of the tensions um, in the Leave vote, all of the tensions in society with which we have failed to grapple. So that profoundly worries me, that outcome. Um, uh, of course, um, the disruption of no deal is not to be underestimated, uh, and it will cause, um, I have no doubt, serious disruption to millions or tens of millions of lives. Um, but... Um, we will then at least have resolved that tension and we will know um, what uh, that form of Brexit means uh, and we will know whether we want it. To go in a sort of slightly different direction, your work has been controversial. Um, it only takes a, a scroll through Twitter to see some people's passion in their arguments against you. Um, you have also been subjected to some ab abusive texts on social media, um, how do you go about dealing with that and how much does that affect you in your day-to-day -day life? Um, I mean, Brexit is enormously uh, controversial generally and I think anyone who works in the sphere, particularly anybody whose work is um, making a difference, uh, is going to attract um, what we might politely call detractors. Um, I mean, it's odd... Uh, doing this work as a lawyer, doing this work which is essentially quite political work as a lawyer because you're used as a lawyer to a much more gentle world in which people don't um, routinely suggest that you're dishonest, uh, a traitor, um, you don't often receive death threats uh, and um, I think I just have learned to understand that if you operate in the political sphere, you can't demand that the world around you adheres to the etiquette of the, of the legal world. Um, I mean, it is personally um, difficult at times. Uh, the work that I do hasn't really been supported by uh, anyone, uh, any of the establishment camps on either side, not by the government, not by the leavers not by people, the People's Vote team, not by Best for Britain. Um, it's something I've done um, myself, in essence. Uh, that has been difficult, um, but, um, you know, very little in life that is worth achieving is easy. And on a final note, what would you say to the students, the, the ordinary person who is looking to, to live in this world post-Brexit or post-whatever happens in the next two months, what would be your advice to them now at this point in time? I, mean, I had a lot of emails from uh, young law students who have got training contracts at big city firms um, asking me essentially this, um, you know, the world is falling down around my ears. Um, I feel passionately about wanting to make the world better. Um, Am I doing the right thing, taking my training contract at, at, at Clifford Chance or whoever it is? And um, the answer I invariably give is absolutely yes. Um, the way in which you will be able to be most useful in the future um, is if you receive the really good quality training um, that you will get at a city firm. It will raise your game. It will make you much, much more useful a participant in civil society uh, than you might be able to be without that training. So um, uh, do, the uh, do the training contract, um, try and keep your expenses down um, so that you don't feel um, trapped into continuing to work at that firm. And then if you still burn with the passion uh, in two years' time, in three years' time that you have now, then you can leave and you can take that training, you can put it to... To, to good use. Uh, there are no grown-ups in the room, right? That's what uh, we've learned over the last few years. Um, 
uh, if we want to fix these problems, we have to fix them ourselves. I absolutely applaud um, that passion. I think it's incredibly important. It is the only way out for us as a society. Um, but put yourself in the best position to be able to be helpful. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.